Hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down 100 Bullets Volume 12 Dirty. This is the penultimate volume, which is a fancy way of saying the next to last volume, the second last volume. So there is only one more volume left after this one. We are almost at the end here. Now, I know some of the commenters here on my channel are ready for me to finally be done with 100 bullets. Because, <laughs> you know, it takes me three or so months to go through all, all of these. But we are almost there. Almost there. Now, this volume is really short. Only spans five issues. But next volume, the final volume, is 12 issues long. And it's going to be about an hour and a half long video. And that one is going to be the uh, big crazy one where everybody dies or not. We'll see who lives until the end. But uh, yeah, next volume is going to be really exciting with the conclusion. But for now, we just have this little quick volume with five one shots to get through. So let's dive into it. 100 Bullets, Volume 12. 100 Bullets, Volume 12. Dirty. Written by Brian Azzarello, art by Eduardo Riso. Just a reminder of who's still alive as we head into this volume. Here is the character breakdown. We see Augustus, Megan, Javier, Joan Darke, Helena Coitius, Thibaut Vermeer, Sigmar Rohn, Consus von Hagen are the remaining trust members. And then we see the various members of the Minuteman. Graves has Dizzy, Cole, Remy, and Victor on his side, and Lano has Loop and Jack. And Wiley, Milo, and Shepard are dead. All right, now we shall begin. 100 Bullets, issue 84, The Lady Tonight. One of the heads of one of the families of the Trust, Sigmar Rohn, is in his casino in Nevada. He has been brought into the security room to handle a situation. Sigmar, not only does he own various casinos, he also has various media interests. He has a record label and radio and cable stations all across the country. So Sigmar, he's been brought into this back room in his casino. One of his rappers is causing trouble. A guy named Jason Swan, a.k.a. Jassy. Jason's a white boy rapper that's maybe not as hard as he claims to be. Sigmar is pissed at this Jason because he was gambling, playing blackjack. He was playing at the same table for 166 minutes. And then all of a sudden, on one hand, he had a 16 down and he hit on it. Normally, you probably wouldn't hit on 16. The dealer dealt him a 7, which made him bust. And this pissed Jason off, so he broke the dealer's wrist. And then when the rapper Jason started losing it, his crew started losing it too, and they started attacking various employees that worked there. We see one of Sigmar's men, a guy named Harvey, who has an eye patch, so you know he's cool. <laughs> Harvey tells the rapper, we have a number of injuries to our staff because you pushed a 16. I mean, a cocktail waitress has her nose fractured. What the hell sort of behavior is that? The white boy rapper responds, Yo, man, it's bad, but we make it all good. You know what I'm saying? Sigmar Roan, sick of this nonsense, says, Jason, drop the black shit. We're not your fans, nor are there any cameras in here. You fucked up. One of Jason's boys argues with Sigmar, saying, It's not that bad, Sigmar. This kind of publicity, it's made for my boy here. Word gets out how hard Jassy is. We're going to sell a lot of records. Sigmar tells this man, I own this casino and your label, among others. Also, the radio and cable stations across the country, you need to sell my records. Word is not getting out. But I'll tell you what is. Sigmar then turns to his man and says, Harvey, take them to the airport. The rapper is pissed. He says, what? We got a show. Sigmar continues and says, I had it canceled. No more gangster bullshit. You're a pop star. Act like one. The rapper argues, Mr. Roan, you can't do that to me. Roan tells him, yes, I can. As the rapper is being ushered out, he tells Sigmar, you'll be sorry. Later on, we see Sigmar Roan at his home. He is with his perfect-looking family, his two young daughters, his young son, his beautiful wife. Life seems pretty good. His wife has to go to some sort of red carpet charity event tonight, and Sigmar says he can't go with her. He has some business to attend to. 
Sigmar, he says bye to his wife and kids, and then he gets in his car. And in the car, he gets a phone call. One of his men tells him that Harvey, the eye patch guy, well, he's dead. He took a bullet on the tarmac at the airport, point blank. It was that rapper and his crew. They killed him, and then they took off in the plane. Sigmar's man asks, how would you like to proceed? Sigmar answers, I don't want the authorities in LA involved. Is it too late to ask for that? Sigmar's guy says, no it isn't sir. Sigmar continues, good, we'll handle this ourselves. Sigmar then hangs up the phone. He then leaves his car. He was traveling to some sort of secluded cabin. At the cabin, many of Sigmar's armed men are around, ensuring his safety. Sigmar then has a meeting with Megan Dietrich's bodyguard named Kate. Sigmar greets her and says, I understand you are here with some information. Kate replies, yes sir, I am, for your ears only. One of Sigmar's bodyguards is nervous when he hears this. He says, Mr. Roan, I can't allow you to be alone with her. It's not safe. Sigmar tells his man, I just received news that Harvey was murdered. I need you to take care of this. Meaning the wannabe gangsters responsible. Make sure any liquid asset they may have dries up before their plane touches ground. Any lingering lawsuits against them get funded. And this story is on the news 10 seconds from now. I want them ruined. Harvey was a good man. He doesn't deserve this kind of end. Sigmar's man tells him, I'll do that for you, Mr. Roan, but I still can't allow you to be in a room alone with that woman. She's a bodyguard, sir. She's very highly trained. So eventually they come up with some kind of compromise so Sigmar can be alone in a room with this woman. They put her in some handcuffs. Sigmar and this Kate woman then talk. Remember, Kate is the bodyguard of Megan, so she is privy to some secret information. It also turns out that it seems like Kate and Sigmar have a secret sexual relationship. And the whole handcuffs thing is kind of a kinky thing that they're kind of into. So while the two of them are starting to have some kinky sex here in this room, Kate is informing Sigmar on what she knows. She says, Megan and Augustus are whispering marriage. Sigmar to this says, love makes one do crazy things, break rules. Kate replies, what rules do you think the trust has left? He's using her. Sigmar answers, she likes it, she needs it. She's new to this. We won't let it come to pass. Kate says, you can't stop it. Augustus and Havyar, they're uniting. They're in this all together. They mean to be the trust, together. Megan has no idea who she's in bed with. Finally, Sigmar and this Kate woman finish their intercourse, and Sigmar tells her, you're not going back there, I can't let you. It's too dangerous. As Sigmar leaves the room he was in with Kate, all of a sudden he sees his bodyguards are all dead outside bullets in their heads and they're lying on the ground and leaned up against the wall. Sigmar, he then looks out into the forest near this cabin. And in that forest, he sees Remy Rome and Victor Ray. And they are there with Sigmar's wife and kids. Kate joins Sigmar outside. Victor, he puts a bullet right in her temple. Sigmar, he's shocked. His wife calls out to him, Sigmar! Remy and Victor, they shoot Sigmar's wife, and then they shoot his two little girls. And then Sigmar's youngest child, the little boy, he's crawling away. Sigmar, with tears in his eyes, says, not my boy. But despite his protesting, Victor and Remy shoot the boy, too. And then finally, lastly, they shoot Sigmar through his head. And then Remy and Victor walk away into the night. 100 Bullets, Issue 85, Red Lions. This issue is going to feature a character we have not seen since way back in Issue 19. The character, Sophie. She was the girlfriend of Loop's cousin, Carlos. Sophie and Carlos stole money from Lano, and when Lano found them, he killed her boyfriend and he raped Sophie repeatedly. Well, we see in the current day now, this incident has had a profound effect on Sophie. She has trained hard in the gym, and she even trains a self-defense class for women. We see Sophie leading the class through various punches and kicks. 
after the class. One of Sophie's students comes to talk with her. She tells Sophie, thank you. This training has been, I, I needed it. I wasn't able to sleep after the incident. Sophie hugs the woman and says, I know, neither was I. The woman wants to give Sophie something. She gives her some pills called Nambient. It's to help people go to sleep, she says. Now I can sleep on my own. I don't need them anymore. While Sophie and this woman are talking, just by happenstance, Lano and his crew walk into the very same gym. So there's Lano, Loop, and Jack. Duh. Lano, Loop, and Jack head inside a boxing ring, and they are teaching Loop how to fight. Jack is sparring with Loop, and Lano is shouting orders. He tells Loop, go for the fucking throat. God damn. Look, kid. A man this size will kick your ass 11 times out of 10. So don't give him a chance to. Clock him yesterday before he smells it coming. While they are training, Sophie is watching from the side. She has poured these sleeping pills inside an energy drink. And she is sipping it by a vending machine. Eventually, Lano leaves the ring. He tells his boys, I'm hitting the sauna. Lano is then walking by Sophie. Lano does not recognize her from his past, but of course, she recognizes him as the man that ruined her life. As Sophie is sipping on the energy drink through a straw, she tells Lano walking by, you want to pick me up? And she offers the drink. Lano, he takes it without even thinking and starts sipping it. Eventually, Lano heads into the sauna to relax. And while he's relaxing, the sleeping pills start kicking in and he gets drowsy and starts falling asleep. Sophie then slips into the sauna room. She has some cleaning ammonia with her, and she pours it over the hot rocks, and then she leaves. The poison and the ammonia starts getting to Lano. He wakes up, but he starts coughing and choking. He stands up and tries to go to the door. Only when he gets to the door, it won't open, because Sophie has taken a weight and positioned it in such a way that it will block the door from opening. Lano can't get out. He starts pounding on the sauna door. Boom, boom, boom. Lano, he's dying. Sophie, she then goes up to the sauna room little window on the door. And she says into it, Do you remember me? I'll never forget you. Sometimes I wake up in bed paralyzed like I'm still tied to it. Not as much anymore, but occasionally I'm still tied to you. I bet you haven't thought about me, though, since you stepped over my boyfriend's body and walked out that door, am I right? I could ask you what you're doing with his cousin now, but I really don't care. See, all I care about is me. That's not really true. I care about people, and what you did to me was a long time ago. I hated myself for it. Then I hated you. No, there's no then. I hate you still. When I saw you come into the gym, I immediately thought you were here to rape me again. You raped me again and again and again. Like I said, I'm tied to you and I realize I will be till the day I die, but not the day you do. And that sucks. You have no idea what you've done to me, how you've infected my life, how hard you've made me cry. I hate you. I promised myself I'd kill you given the chance. And this is it. I, I needed to show you that I could. I'm not like you, but... You are like me. You're vulnerable. She then opens the sauna door and she lets Lano live. Although she leaves him with the knowledge that she could have killed him if she wanted to. But she is not a killer like him. As Sophie leaves, she tells Lano, You know what I am? I'm better than you. And she heads out. 100 Bullets, Issue 86, Rain in Vain. In a snowy mountain town, Helena Cotius and Constance von Hagen, both heads of their own families in the trust, they are talking about the death of Sigmar Rohn. Apparently, both of them were having affairs with him. They comment how he was so horny, but he was such a great lover. Helena comments... It was nice to feel I had a leg up on that trophy wife of his. The two of them then go shopping to make themselves feel better. While they were shopping, Victor Ray, the rain, murdered them. 
And even later on that day, Victor went to a bar to kill some time. While he's in that bar, a man meets Victor and gives him a piece of paper that says Belcourt, room 178 on it. Victor appears to be looking for some information on someone. While Victor is killing time in this bar, one of the very scantily clad workers in this bar is talking about what she saw earlier. It turns out that this woman also happens to work in the same clothing store that Helena Cotius and Constance von Hagen were killed in earlier, and she was the one that discovered their bodies. She is telling the story to a bartender friend of hers that works in this bar. She says how they were dead, and they called the police, and then the police came and asked them questions, and one of the women that was dead was Helena Cotius. She must own every hotel in this city. She then wonders, why wasn't this on the news? They're watching the news right now on the bar. She feels like it is something the news would definitely talk about. Victor, overhearing this conversation, chimes in and says, You'll read about it tomorrow, how she died after a long battle with cancer or some other noble bullshit that kills the rich. The woman tells Victor, What? No, I saw her dead. Victor replies, No, I'm telling you how she died. The woman asks, How do you know how she died? Victor answers, Cause I'm noble bullshit. Victor asks the woman, These poor old rich deers you saw, were you the last one to see him alive? The woman answers, Yeah. Victor asks, So it was you who shot him? The woman now says, What? No. Victor says, Sure. The last one to see him alive is the one that killed him. The woman says, I, I wasn't the last. Victor asks, You tell the cops you were? That'll make you a suspect. Victor then tells the woman, So you were the first to see them dead? The woman answers, Yes. Well, the second. There was a man after I found them. He was gone. I didn't talk to him. One of the other girls did. He said he was just looking. Victor happened to be that man. Victor asks her, What did he look like? The woman answers, Oh, he had on a Rockies cap, sunglasses, maybe a tracksuit and sneakers. He didn't look like anybody. He looked like everybody else. Victor replies, Hmm. Sounds like a professional. He must be halfway to Kansas by now, no? The woman, confused, asks, What does any of this have to do with these murders not being on the news? Victor answers, Nothing. And everything. I gotta go. Victor, he then leaves the bar to go handle a personal matter. Something he saw on the news that was pissing him off. What was pissing Victor off is he saw on the news that a woman named Tamara Towns. She had three children and one on the way. She was eight months pregnant. And she was killed by her ex-husband, Stephen Earl Marshall, and Stephen's girlfriend, Rihanna Sharp. Together, they killed Tamara, and they killed two of the other children, and put them in a washing machine. And then, with scissors, they cut the unborn baby from Tamara. And they took the five-year-old boy and the eight-month baby that was still in the womb. We now see Stephen Earl Marshall and his girlfriend Rihanna Sharp with the kidnapped five-year-old boy and the premature baby they ripped from the womb. The woman is devastated as the baby they ripped from the womb did not survive and ended up dying. So now they have to get rid of it. The woman pleads, it was my baby. The man tells her, you gotta get rid of it. Well, this apparently was the horrific story that Victor saw on the news that pissed him off. So Victor, he paid off the guy in the bar that he knew to somehow get him the location of where this couple would be held up. Victor, he arrives at the hotel room door. He knocks on it. The kidnapper on the other side opens the door and Victor with an ax cuts through the man's head. Then Victor heads inside. He finds the kidnapped five-year-old, Justin, and then Victor heads into the bathroom. There he finds the other kidnapper, Rihanna Sharp. She was trying to dispose of the baby that died in the toilet. Victor goes over to the woman and drowns her in the toilet, killing her. Once both of these kidnappers are dead, Victor grabs the little boy, Justin, and brings him outside to safety. Once Victor has dealt with this situation, 
he leaves this motel and goes into a limo where Graves and Dizzy are waiting for him. Graves compliments Victor's work earlier in the day. When he killed Helena Cotius and Constance Von Hagen, Graves says, Good job today, Victor. Very clean. Victor answers, Thank you. Graves then talks about the murders that Victor just did in the hotel here. He says, But your job here tonight? Not so clean. Victor replies, Fuck you and your attache. And that is the end of the issue. Personally, I don't fully get it. Did Victor have a personal connection with this kidnapping couple and that's why he wanted to kill them? Or did he just find their behavior so abhorrent that he wanted to take them down and right a wrong? Victor also mentioned an attache that Graves gave him and Victor didn't want it. Was that in relation to this couple or not? So I'm not so sure. Let me know in the comments what you think this story here means. Moving on to the next issue, 100 Bullets issue 87, The Blister. On a rooftop, one of the few surviving members of one of the families of the Trust, Joan Darcy, is having a meeting with a man named Will Slaughter. Will Slaughter used to be a Minuteman back in the day. He is also the father of current Minuteman, Victor Ray. Will actually trained Victor to be his replacement, and then when he retired, Victor took his place. Joan, meeting with Will, wants to contract him to do a job for her. She also discusses how the other members of the Trust are dropping like flies, and she says that she thinks she's next. Will to this says, maybe not next, but you are on the laundry list. Now Will, he's claiming he's retired and he doesn't kill anymore, but if the price is right, he'll do a part-time job every so often. After beating around the bush for a while, Will finally asks, If you want me to kill Graves for you, it'll cost you. Joan replies, Graves? No, but there is someone else. Later on, we see Will is back home with his lovely family that he retired to. He's got a wife and three little girls. And they really seem like the picturesque, perfect family. Later that night, Will is in his bathroom and he's getting ready. He's shaven. Will's wife, Peggy, goes over to talk with him. She knows that her husband only shaves when he's taken a job. Will admits that he has taken a job. He says, I'm going to get moving on it tonight, but it might take a while, Peg. Peggy asks, how long? Will answers, a while, maybe. I'm not sure yet. I'll know when I get started. Peggy asks, is it in town? Will, he doesn't answer. He says, come on, we know it's better for you that you don't know any of the details. Just in case he doesn't come back, he tells his wife, here, this is a new number for a new account. We have a college fund for the girls. Peggy tells her husband, I know I say it every time you go, but you are in one messed up line of work. Will, he then packs his little suitcase of guns and all the tools he's going to need. And then he kisses his wife goodbye. He tells her, I'll call you tomorrow. Will, he then goes and says bye to his little girls too. And he heads out. Elsewhere, the Minuteman, Remy Rome, is indeed trying to kill Joan D'Arcy. He has infiltrated her compound and he is single-handedly killing all of her men. We see various pages of Remy shooting and people dying. He makes his way through the entire complex, and then he gets to the room where he thought Joan would be. But when he gets inside, she is not there. Later on, Remy goes to a diner to meet with Graves and Dizzy. Graves asks, So Remy, we done? Remy answers, No, we ain't frickin' done. Your intelligence sucks. The place was guarded up like Fort frickin' Knox. I odd jobbed no sweat, but she wasn't there. Graves responds, She was supposed to be. Remy continues, Well, I guess that makes you a weatherman, huh? Here's the forecast. Don't blame me if the sun don't shine. Dizzy, she looks at Remy and asks, You seem annoyed, and that's annoying me. Remy starts getting pissed off. He says, Listen, there's no freaking way I'm taking the blame for this. Graves, he tells Remy, No more whiny bullshit. Guys like you, guys like you, you get F on the details. That's a problem. 
I need you to step back, take in the big picture, get off on that, and get the job done. Graves, he then storms off with Dizzy. 100 Bullets, Issue 88, My Lonely Friend. In Atlantic City on the boardwalk, Cole Burns is meeting with Mr. Branch. Cole is supposed to go into a bar nearby and meet with Ronnie Rome to retrieve the La Morte del Césaire painting that he collected from Italy. But first, he had Branch go inside before him and scope it out. Branch, just having coming back from scoping it out, tells Cole, Yeah, he's in there. Cole asks, he alone? Branch answers, It looks that way. Branch, he then sits down on the bench and starts sipping a beer. Cole, he gets up. He's got to go meet with Ronnie. Before he leaves, though, he touches Branch on the shoulder and tells him, You know, I killed a man sitting on this bench one time. Branch nervous asks, One time? Cole says, One time so far. Bonsoir, Monsieur Branch. Cole then heads out. The person Cole was referring to who he killed on this bench was Daniel Perez, whom he killed in issue 25. Cole, he then heads inside the bar, and there he finds Ronnie Rome. Cole, he sits down at the bar and asks him, You got it, buddy? The two of them start discussing how they're gonna do the exchange. Meanwhile, outside on that bench where Mr. Branch is waiting, all of a sudden, Echo Memoria goes and sits beside Branch. Echo asks Branch, When we were together that time, I drew the impression that this life was something you found abhorrent. Branch replies, I still do. Echo, smoking a cigarette, asks, But what now? Branch responds, Now I'm living it. Echo blows out her cigarette and says, That's trippy, becoming one's own obsession. Branch replies, that's a beautiful way of putting what I am. So, you're not a prostitute anymore? Echo answers, I am what the situation requires. Branch asks, what does that make me? Echo, she then just laughs. Cole and Ronnie have gone up to a hotel room where Ronnie has the painting. He has now given it over to Cole. The two of them talk a bit. Cole tells Ronnie, you know I know your brother. I have some trouble with him. He killed a friend of mine. Cole is referring to Wiley Times. Cole continues, He killed a friend of mine who I didn't like, but respected. We didn't get along. Not like me and your brother don't, but it was different. Ronnie comments, You respected him. Cole says, Yeah, I figure I owe him one. Cole, he then points his gun to Ronnie's head. He wants to kill Ronnie in revenge for Remy killing Cole's friend Wiley. Ronnie tells Cole, look, my brother's a dick. Cole says, are you just saying that because you know what I'm about to do? Ronnie continues, no, I'm saying that because I know my brother better than you do. In the end, Cole decides not to kill Ronnie, and he just leaves with the painting. Cole, he goes back outside, back to Branch, sitting on the bench. Cole tells him, well, Stump, it looks like we got what we came for. Screw that canned piss beer you got. Let's go get us a real round, huh, Stump? Stump? Cole then sees that Mr. Branch is dead, killed by Echo Memoria. And with this, we end Volume 12 of 100 Bullets. This has been a very short volume, but the next volume is very long, and will lead up to an epic conclusion. Which of our beloved 100 Bullets characters are going to make it to the end and survive? We will find out in the conclusion in Volume 13. Alright, let me go through my thoughts on the various issues in this volume. So the first issue, issue 84, The Lady Tonight, we are introduced to Sigmar Roan, and we are really spending some time with him. I liked the little scene with him in the casino dealing with that wannabe gangster guy. Uh, it was interesting seeing him be kind of a sex fiend. <laughs> and then we had uh, Victor and Remy uh, killing him. And they also killed his entire family, which was a little bit dark. But, you know, maybe they had to die, the family, the, the wife and the little girls and the little boy, because they would be the heirs of uh, Sigmar and would potentially inherit his seat in the trust. So maybe they had to die. Maybe. 
Um, but yeah, it was kind of dark to have them all get killed off there. But uh, yeah, another death uh, in the Trusts camp, and we are elevating the plot forward, so uh, I kind of dug the issue. The next issue, issue 85, Red Lions, that is the one with Sophie and Lano. And I really like the idea of bringing this Sophie character back into the mix. She was kind of a throwaway character that I kind of forgot about. But bringing her back in is pretty interesting. And seeing her get some revenge on Lano was satisfying to see. Now, she probably should have killed Lano, but Lano is such a good villain. We don't want Lano to die yet, do we? So I'm okay with Lano still living. But it was either way nice to have Sophie uh, get some sort of revenge and closure there. The next issue, issue 86, Rain in Vain, that is Victor Ray killing Constance and Helena, and uh, I did not think this issue was that good. I would have liked to see the death be a little bit more played out and shown a little bit in a cooler way, and uh, I also think Victor going on this random adventure to this motel to take down this husband and wife that kidnapped some kids to just be random and not explained as much as I would have liked. Why did Victor do that? I still don't really get it. I don't, and uh, did Graves give him an attache or something? Because he mentioned an attaches. It's not fully explained, so I don't like it. I didn't love, did not love that issue. Issue 87, The Blister. We are introduced to this guy, Will Slaughter, who used to be a Minute Man back in the day, but he is retired now. But the uh, head of the trust, one of the families of the trust, Joan Darcy, hires him to do a job for her. And, uh, you know, this is just a setup issue introducing us to Will. But Will is going to play an important part in the final volume. He does a couple cool uh, things in it. So uh, be on the lookout for Will Slaughter. Remember his name because he's going to be important in the next volume. The final issue here, issue 88, My Lonely Friend. That is with uh, Cole Burns meeting with Ronnie Rome and getting that painting. And then Echo Memoria comes and uh, talks with Branch. And, you know, what the fudge is the idea, is, the, is uh, Echo's obsession with this painting? She had it in, in Italy and she was trying to sell it. And then I got, um, then Ronnie sort of bought it off her. And now she's coming to collect the painting again? Get over it. <laughs> and then she kills Branch? I liked Branch. So anyway, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't love it. I don't love it. But uh, whatever, Branch is dead, and Echo is out there trying to get the painting again. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I'm a little mixed on this volume. I think some of the issues were really solid, and some of them were not so great. I'm gonna give this volume a seven out of ten. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with the final volume, the series finale. Mm -hmm.